Welcome to the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies at the University of London. My name is Carl Stitchen, and I'm the director of IELTS. It's my pleasure to host today's seminar, which is another in our regular series featuring this year's visiting research fellows at the Institute. Today's guest is Professor Tim Potier. Tim is a member of the Department of International Law at the Moscow State Institute of International Relations. He is a specialist on post-conflict societies and has previously written extensively on the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh. This is the second year Tim has been a visiting fellow at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies. His research project at IELTS, still ongoing, is entitled Avoiding a Surfeit of Standards in International Law Towards an Accepted Hard and Soft Law International Legal Framework. He has expertise in a wide range of legal subjects. He currently teaches at MGIMO, both general and specialist courses on international law, including a course on security issues in international law, as well as courses on the philosophy of law, English legal history, and the law of trusts. Tim intends to convert his presentation today into a journal article, which will be his first written work on the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh for a decade. And as if all of this wasn't enough, he's about to finish a book on Roman inheritance law. So quite a spread there. Tim's paper today is entitled Securing a Lasting Settlement in Nagorno-Karabakh Following the Recent War. Our format is as follows. Tim will speak for about 40 minutes, and this will be followed by questions and comments from audience members. I will be moderating questions through the Q&A function, so you're welcome to type your questions and your comments in the Q&A box at any time during and after Tim's presentation. Closed captioning should also be available on your screen at the bottom, should this be helpful to you. So without further delay, I'm very pleased to welcome Tim. Over to you, Tim. Well, thank you, Carl, if I may uh, call you Carl. We've known each other, of course, the vast majority of you wouldn't know this for nearly 30 years. So uh, Professor Stitchin, thank you very much for your introduction. I hope you can all hear me well. I have, uh, after some thought, because I spend my entire life and career teaching uh, lectures to students and various courses, and I have avoided, I thought, the temptation of sort of converting this presentation this afternoon into another sort of boring lecture with slides. So although I will be referring myself to some uh, slides I have prepared, I'll try and keep it as dynamic as I can and as interesting as I can. I'd like to thank you for uh, joining uh, this um, seminar this afternoon. And before I begin, I'd like to just make uh, something clear. This is a research work on the aftermath of the recent war, which is ongoing. So many of my thoughts, which I'll present to you this afternoon, I would regard as preliminary, tentative, and that's why I may sometimes deliberately uh, appear somewhat hesitant in my voice because many of you listening right now, I hope to discuss some of these issues with over the next couple of months while I am uh, converting this presentation this afternoon into at least to begin with an initial article, but because of the wide ranging nature of the subject matter, probably over the next few months convert into more than one hopefully published journal article. So therefore I just want you to be reassured because I will take soundings after this afternoon with relevant people to enrich my thoughts of course and it's quite likely that some of what I may say this afternoon if not with also your guidance this afternoon also um, in the um, discussion session later um, may very well be adjusted. Now I'd like to just spend a few moments um, by reflecting on the events of recent months. I do rather regret the fact that in the end peace couldn't be sustained and that a war was fought uh, during the latter part 
of last year. I regard that as regrettable because I regard what occurred last year as having been an avoidable war. Having followed the process since the early mid 1990s, of course, the relevant negotiating um, mediating parties did their level best over the last nearly three decades to get essentially the two sides to reach a final and uh, uh, understood agreement. But nevertheless, um, that was not possible. And what is, I think, most regrettable is that during that period of time of around 25 years, approximately, the, the sides, I'm afraid, took rather maximalist positions. And if there had been, I would uh, suggest, a greater willingness on both sides to step back a little and seek to secure through concessions, mutual concessions, some form of fair compromise, then I think that what occurred late last year could have been avoided. Of course, because of the fact that over a period of time, the conflict became increasingly, so to speak, frozen, that meant naturally that the international community came to rather forget about the unsolved conflict. And the OSCE Minsk Group, the mediators in this conflict, they did their very best. But I think towards the end, perhaps during the last decade, their process uh, became rather half-hearted, if I may say. And even prior to the last decade, I do feel that with the benefit of hindsight, of course, that there were occasions when the Minsk group rather oscillated, swung from the one side to the other and then back to the original side again in their uh, valiant efforts to try and secure any form of compromise from the sides. So I think how I would begin this afternoon, I, I would like to stress that I regard what happened last year as having been an avoidable war. Now, of course, in light of what has occurred since the ceasefire agreement of the 10th of November 2020, there's been a certain, of course, naturally triumphalism on the one side and sorrow, to say the least, on the other. I don't regard there as being any winners from this war to a greater or lesser extent, depending, of course, on the situation and circumstances, I believe both sides have lost something. Of course, after the heady sense of pride that emanated from victory, quote unquote, from the first war, the defeat uh, for the Armenian side in this recent second war has, of course, come as a crushing hammer blow for the Armenian side, not only in Nagorno-Karabakh, but also in Armenia itself, as well as in the wider diaspora around the world. And I think we must accept that it is going to take time for the Armenian side to recover from the shock, the simple raw shock of what has occurred, the suddenness of the transformation, and the consequent loss. Nevertheless, in recent days, I do believe that President Biden's recognition of the Armenian genocide is a welcome um, intervention, and I hope will enable all sides to finally draw a line in the sand with regard to the events of the past century. I have, over the last nearly 30 years that I've been working on this conflict, felt on occasions that it has become or been, at least in part, a hostage to history. By no means the only conflict, of course, which is a hostage to history, but it, I, has, I have often felt that it has been a hostage to history. And I just hope now that that 
recognition having been made from such, of course, an important quarter that we can now move on and look only to and towards the future. Now, understandably, and, and this is entirely understandable, I accept this, the sense of relief and jubilation on the Azeri side is not only palpable, but entirely natural. Not least after the disastrous first war, when I have to say, I mean, uh, I'm talking to you now from Moscow, where I now live and work and have done for a while, but I remember, I mean, Azerbaijan was the first former Soviet Republic I visited back in 1995. By the way, Armenia was the second before, in both cases, I'd even visited Russia. And so I was first in Azerbaijan very shortly after the ceasefire, after the first war, ceasefire of 1994, that is. And I have to say, I don't remember in the months and years after that initial ceasefire so very much assistance or pity um, for the Azeri side being shown, including internationally. They had to bear their loss and their burden, and I think they did that with equanimity. And uh, so, therefore, it's entirely understandable and natural that they feel the sense of relief and jubilation. However, of course, there will come hopefully a point very, very soon where they need to, the Azerbaijani community as a whole, not only its government, need to begin to look towards the longer term. Now, I appreciate that rather controversially in recent weeks, there has been established a, as it's called, a military trophy park in Baku. But I really would hope that that park is only temporary. And I think at some point, sooner rather than later, um, of course, I can appreciate that feeling to celebrate and to commemorate, but I think that that trophy park ought to, at some point, sooner rather than later, be closed and then dismantled, if only to demonstrate to the Armenian community in Karabakh, as well as um, a wider uh, Armenian community outside of Karabakh, that Baku does see a future in the Armenian people, not only forming perhaps eventually again de facto as well as de jure a part of Azerbaijan, but also feel the confidence in the future to return to cities like Baku, for example, to live, work, etc. And that's a point I will come back to later. But that sense of jubilation of triumphalism does need to dampen down fairly soon in order to begin to look towards the future, plan ahead, and give that confidence to the Karabakh Armenian community that perhaps they do have a place after all in uh, the Republic of Azerbaijan in the future. So I think that's something that ought to be borne in mind over the coming months. I think for the um, period until, let's say, the spring of next year, 2022, I think there will and indeed needs to be a pause. And in that sense, therefore, expectations for what can be achieved during the period, let's say, at least until the spring of next year, 2022, ought to be limited. I think, as I've indicated, there needs to be a period of calming down, of reflection, uh, of appreciation of what has just occurred. And I think what is a priority in the meantime, at least until the spring of next year, is to ensure that the ceasefire is maintained, that um, any remaining bodies are recovered, including remains uh, and returned to the other side, whichever the other side is, to the extent that that is possible. And I appreciate that 
there are going to be inevitably some persons that may remain missing for a very long time, if not forever. Inevitably, that's one of the consequences of war, that there should be an exchange of all prisoners of war and other detainees, uh, that that should be undertaken, that exchange, of course, in compliance with all norms of international humanitarian law, including in respect of the treatment of such prisoners, detainees um, in the meantime. Now, I appreciate that if one's following the news regarding what's occurred since uh, the ceasefire of November, there is still a lot of discussion about whether all prisoners, detainees have been exchanged or not. And I'm not on the ground, so I somewhat on, on this point and others rely on what the media says. But let's not worry about um, how many there are and whether there are. Let's just um, be clear that, of course, during the coming months, uh, that all such prisoners of war and other detainees do need to be the soonest uh, exchanged and returned. Of course, also the other point I wish to stress, uh, which is very important for the interim, for the short term at least, is the release of all data, maps, etc., in order for demining activities to proceed uh, both uh, more expeditiously and effectively. It's a, it's a tragedy. I feel very sorry for um, displaced persons who have, from their, again, entirely understandable excitement, hastily uh, returned in some capacity to their former towns or villages and suffered injury because of mines that remain in uh, situ in the uh, theater. And so remembering visiting uh, Azeri quote unquote refugee camps in the mid 1990s and in the early part of this century, I, I, I really feel for those people and of course others, it, it wouldn't just apply to them. And I, I think it really is a priority that all data, including maps um, to facilitate demining operations um, should be um, given up, relinquished as soon as possible. Now, for the short to medium term, it is vital that religious and cultural heritage is both protected, preserved, and what can be recovered is recovered. I understand from recent media reports that a UNESCO mission is uh, in the offing, a UNESCO mission is um, pending uh, to visit the region, and that's a very good thing. I do think it might be a good idea to involve third parties in the processes of protecting, etc., religious and cultural heritage. I wonder to what extent perhaps the work of UNESCO in this regard might be uh, capably supported perhaps by, on the one side, a designated country member of the Eurasian Economic Union and uh, also perhaps equivalently a designated uh, member state of the European Union. I think that would um, assist this process, this very vital process of ensuring that um, what uh, remains um, is protected and preserved. But I would go beyond that. I would um, recommend that assuming that if we accept that the dispute erupted back in 1988, we can quibble about dates, but let's say for argument's sake around 1988, I do think that this work should also include a compiling of an inventory of sites, of religious and cultural sites that existed in 1988 in order that we can establish uh, what has been lost and uh, what has been damaged and whether in respect of anything that has been lost or damaged, not only in Nagorno-Karabakh itself, but also in 
uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia. When I say Azerbaijan, I mean wider Azerbaijan. Uh, you understand that, plus Armenia, that we can establish that um, an inventory of what has been lost and or damaged in order to then seek the recovery also of religious and cultural heritage. It's not just only, I believe, for me, a matter of protecting and preserving what has, quote unquote, survived the wars, survived the last 30 or so years. It's also, I believe, uh, important to establish what has been damaged or lost in order to then establish whether any of what has been damaged or lost can be salvaged in any way. Now, I appreciate that this work should begin in and around Nagorno-Karabakh, but I think, as I indicated a moment ago, eventually that should be expanded to include the remaining parts of Azerbaijan and Armenia as well, because um, in 1988, when the crisis erupted, we all recall, don't we, that there were once substantial communities of Armenians living in Azerbaijan as a whole, not only in Nagorno-Karabakh, and on the other side, uh, Azerbaijanis um, living in Armenia. And inevitably their uh, religious and cultural heritage needs to be um, uh, itemized and, as I said, um, established its condition and its state. And I think that is very important. This provides an opportunity, one of the opportunities following this recent war to act as a kind of good practice, as an example, good practice as a template for other post-conflict regions and societies around the world. And here I think is one of those opportunities where if this can be undertaken well and successfully, then in the future, both Yerevan and Baku can assist in these processes internationally and over the coming decades, explain and teach how you all did it, so to speak. I think that's very important. Now, what are the OSCE Mintz Group? There's been some chatter, hasn't there, about whether the Mintz Group still has any place, whether it should cease its work, whether um, uh, it has any role. From my perspective, the work of the Mintz Group needs to continue. Indeed, it needs to be refreshed. I think it's become rather stale. There has been some discussion about whether some of the members should be replaced with new members. I wouldn't recommend that personally. I think that uh, Russia, of course, as well as the United States and France, should remain members of the Minsk Group. Those three countries have acquired by now substantial expertise in respect of this conflict, and I think it would be a pity for that to be lost. However, and here I get to one of the, if I may say, more controversial parts of what I'm going to tell you this afternoon. Although I wouldn't have imagined myself saying this in November or December of last year, as um, this year has proceeded, 2021, I have thought long and hard in recent weeks about whether if Turkey had been admitted to the Minsk group earlier, uh, that is uh, before, uh, long before the recent conflict um, last year, then perhaps that conflict might have been avoided. It might have um, assisted the uh, respective sides to make those compromises, which I indicated that unfortunately they weren't able to make to make those compromises sooner. I also think that perhaps it would be good for French-Turkish correspondence, which has been rather difficult uh, the last couple of years, last year included in the Mediterranean, for example, to have them both participating on a uh, structure such as the 
OS Siemens Group, the continued correspondence between the US and Russia is, of course, important. And because of the danger that the conflict and the impact on the region may divide, let's say, regional or international powers, for example, one other thing that could be considered to further refresh and enrich the Minsk Group is perhaps as observers for the European Union and also the Eurasian Union to participate in work with the Minsk Group as observers. I think that would um, be of beneficial uh, benefit to all sides. All side. And, and I think require uh, the EU and the EA, EU to begin to correspond uh, with each other about um, the region, the South Caucasus, and other parts of Eastern Europe, those two organizations needs to be enhanced. And I think this might provide an early opportunity for that to occur. Now, as far as road and rail communications are concerned, this is reflected in the ceasefire agreement. It provides in the first sentence that all economic and transport connect in the region shall be unblocked. And of course, inevitably, there is tremendous focus of attention on the restoration of road and railroad links between Iran and Azerbaijan, um, wider Azerbaijan. And while that's very important, and I think that that uh, old railway line and uh, that road needs to be uh, facilitated, as well as, of course, opened for um, to provide between Azerbaijan and Azerbaijan and can extend on into Turkey, and that's a benefit. Of course, paragraph nine of the agreement of November speaks of all connections being unblocked, and I think it would be to the advantage of all sides if the, as opposed to the southern road and railroad links um, through Sunik, uh, district of Armenia um, were revitalized. I think also the northern route from Yerevan uh, to Ijevan, uh, on into Azerbaijan at Gazak, and then on into Baku and then north into Russia. I think that should also be added with Syria and with a mind to the opening of that uh, communication by road and railroad as to as possible. Of course, this all, all being without prejudice to the opening of other uh, return of territories is concerned. I do think um, for the purposes of future negotiations, inevitably the status of Nagorno-Karabakh will have established for the sake of future negotiations. I do think that in medium term, at least uh, all territory that was once part of the former Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Oblast should be returned to the Armenian side, with perhaps the exception of the city of Shusha. I understand that uh, this was, of course, before the crisis erupted in the late 1980s. This was a majority Azerbaijani, ethnic Azerbaijani city. It is culturally of tremendous importance for the Azerbaijani um, community, the Azerbaijani people. And I think that that may be uh, excluded from a future Nagorno-Karabakh region, but uh, nevertheless, I do believe that other parts of the former uh, autonomous oblast that were previously earlier, much earlier, um, lost to the Armenian side, quote unquote lost, and those parts of the former autonomous oblast 
which have uh, been lost, again, quote unquote, following the recent war. I think that at some point uh, that uh, needs to be uh, returned to the Armenian side. And that can be, I think, facilitated with the um, establishment of perhaps a hybrid national peacekeeping force uh, following the adoption of a UN Security Council res resolution, um, that um, hybrid force perhaps being under Russian command, and perhaps in good faith, this territory, particularly I'm thinking, but not exclusively, of course, in the south of Nagorno-Karabakh, could be patrolled by a special and likely armed joint Karabakh, Armenian, and Azeri police force. So it could have um, an Azeri component, this lightly armed joint police force as well. But I do think that there needs to be some return of territories, which would therefore suggest, as I would recommend, the return of uh, refugees and internally displaced persons, not only um, Azerbaijani um, refugees and displaced persons, but also Armenian uh, displaced persons and refugees, including from the recent conflict, with, of course, the assistance of the UNHCR. And it goes well, I think, in the longer term, it's too, too, perhaps too soon to speak of it now, but in the longer term, then if things go well, both Yerevan and Baku should be encouraged to allow uh, Armenian, Azerbaijani, respectively, refugees uh, to return to the other republic uh, from where, as I indicated earlier, there were social communities before the first war, as well as, again, for the longer term, hopefully providing the opportunity for members of the other community to live in the other republic who are not IDPs or refugees. I mean, I, uh, many of you won't realize this, but I make occasional visits to Chechnya, to Grozny, um, and one of the things is that the horrible wars of recent years, decades. So um, if it can be done in Chechnya, then I think it can't be done in Armenia and Azerbaijan. I uh, have indicated earlier that uh, the status of Karabakh will inevitably have to be determined. And when I wrote a book 20 years ago, I recommended after very careful thought that Karabakh should remain as a self-autonomy within Azerbaijan. Truth, I still am of there are two ways this, this issue could go, either towards sort of erecting new walls and uh, uh, trying to establish some kind of independence, uh, de jure even, for Karabakh. But I think that's only going to uh, lead to the prolongation, the unnecessary prolongation of this question uh, for this region, for the far future may never be resolved, may even endanger the possibility of a war, for example. So therefore, I think for all sides' stakes, I think it would be better advisable for um, Karabakh to be given some kind of regional status within Azerbaijan, some of self-government. I'm not going to exhaust and bore you with how that um, autonomy could be reflected. But I think, as in other post-conflict regions and societies around the world, that could, uh, as they demonstrate, that could include limits on uh, immigration into the region, uh, which would be determined by the regional authorities. There would still be, of course, um, one single international person, international legal person, known as the Republic of Azerbaijan, and therefore a single citizenship. But I, I would see no harm uh, in correspondence with Baku for a slightly different 
in its style and composition um, passport to be awarded to those of the Karabakh region that wanted a slightly in style and composition different um, passport, although it would still need, of course, throughout that passport and any other relevant documents to be clear that um, Karabakh was part of the Republic of Azerbaijan. As far as the Karabakh armed forces are concerned, I see it as um, two options, either to convert uh, those forces into a, a guard for the region, which could eventually be integrated into the armed forces of Azerbaijan, albeit as a separate unit, or as has often been proposed uh, into some form of militarized police force. And indeed, it would be uh, important in some shape or form for some type of police force within the region of Nagorno-Karabakh to have um, both Armenian and Azeri personnel included within that regional police force, because we would hope, wouldn't we, that um, ethnic Azerbaijanis would also, even outside of Shusha city, uh, return to Nagorno-Karabakh in the not too distant future. The Lachin Corridor is a complicated one, and we could discuss this for two hours and still not be much the wiser as a result of a, a long discussion this afternoon on it. So I will avert uh, that temptation. Um, but I think the Lachin Corridor um, should um, eventually be internationalized and of course its status be determined in any final negotiated settlement. I need about another five minutes, I think, and then I'll be done. Just um, two or three more points before I close. I do think beyond um, transportation, communications, and therefore trade, I do think that it is important to establish some form of regional cooperation between not only Armenia and Azerbaijan, but that, that also should include Georgia as well with the region of Nagorno-Karabakh involved. Where things get a little bit complicated, I admit, is with respect to uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, not least because some countries, a, a small handful of countries uh, around the world, including Russia, of course, have in recent years recognized the independence of Abkhazia or South Ossetia. But in regional terms, I think that at some point it is vital for uh, Georgia to uh, reestablish some form of trusted relations with Moscow uh, and uh, establish some kind of future relationship in whatever shape or form, even if it's not very different, if at all, from things as they exist de facto right now. I think that would be to the advantage of all sides, including for the region in the future. And such kind of regional cooperation, I see no harm in it in observer capacity, including Russia, Turkey, Iran. And again, for the same kind of reasons as I indicated earlier, perhaps also the European Union and also the Eurasian Economic Union. Two or three final points. At some point, work on delimitation and demarcation of the borders between Armenia and Azerbaijan will need to be um, established by way of a joint commission. Of course, that's dependent upon the normalization of relations between the two countries, including diplomatic relations. They can't sustainably uh, rely on old Soviet military maps as they are doing currently for very much longer. That needs to be um, proceeded with. It takes many years. I understand that that work in demarcating and delimiting the border between Armenia and Georgia is still ongoing, for example. I learn um, that in recent weeks, Azerbaijan has filed a case against Armenia before the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, accusing um, Yerevan of various things, including human rights violations, of not um, uh, providing information about missing persons from the first war, as well as regarding the use of certain uh, munitions against 
civilian areas far from the conflict zone. I think matters of state responsibility, if I can generalize this discussion to uh, the wider uh, notion of state responsibility, I think that needs to be proceeded with, with tremendous care. I'm not saying that future claims should be um, ignored or avoided, but I do think diplomatically, not least, I think that's a matter which requires a lot of careful thought because it could damage other opportunities in respect of uh, some of the other issues I've discussed um, this afternoon. And then finally, and this is my last point, um, regarding the peacemaking force, we have the, in addition to the peacemaking force, the peacemaking center. I appreciate that the peacemaking force um, can be renewed for uh, future five-year terms after an initial five years. I do think that in eventually uh, that uh, peacemaking, peacekeeping, whatever force should eventually be brought under a United Nations mandate, again, uh, perhaps under Russian command. And I think that that peacekeeping, sorry, peacemaking center should also likewise eventually brought under that mandate too. With, I would hope, if all goes well, within a generation, the aim being for uh, such a force to be withdrawn. Eventually, uh, the excitement, um, at least for some of recent weeks and months, will die down. And there is a danger, isn't there, that if things are not handled carefully, that the um, certain elements within Azerbaijan might come in years to come, not next week or next month, but in, in the further future, to regard potentially uh, such a peacemaking force, if it's there for the longer term, into some kind of occupying force, occupying force within Azerbaijan. And I think in light of what Russia has done in recent weeks and months to um, uh, assist the situation there uh, with the deployment of these uh, peacemakers, I think that would be a grave pity. And so I think therefore that this needs to be converted under some kind of UN mandate with the aim eventually in the longer term for that peacemaking force finally to be withdrawn. And I would hope that through some of the other recommendations I've discussed with you this afternoon, as I said at the outset, which are in my head even still tentative, that that would uh, not be in any way designed to uh, reduce the input of Moscow in the South Caucasus region uh, as a whole, but to um, perhaps in a more global ground. For every, including for Moscow. So I want war, a terrible tragedy, but where there is conflict, there's always opportunity as a result. I hope I've tried to reflect some of those opportunities. And I hope, and this is my perhaps last sentence before I pause, I hope that um, now that what has occurred has occurred as we move forward, that we don't see as being potentially a loss for any side. It doesn't need to be a loss for the Armenian side, longer term for the Azerbaijani side, for other forces and countries in the region and um, internationally, including, as I've just indicated, um, a loss, not a loss for, for Russia, for Moscow. So with patience and fairness and compromise, I think uh, it can be a win-win for all sides potentially in the future. And there, I'm sorry if I spoke a bit longer, um, but uh, I'll pause. Well, thank you very much, Tim. And uh, we apologize for some of the network difficulties um, that uh, we've been having today. We've got questions coming in uh, through our Q&A function. And um, our audience members are welcome to continue to send questions in. I've been reading them and I'll be moderating them. Uh, but I'm going to use the chair's prerogative to ask the first question myself, which is um, to ask you to 
Tim, to reflect on whether you think the uh, election of the Biden administration will be significant in terms of uh, the future of, of the region in terms of uh, peacemaking. Yes, I think it is very significant. I hope I indicated already that um, the um, decision by President Biden to formally recognize the Armenian genocide, I think, um, has, I think, finally um, sort of not settled matters, but I think it has released a lot of the tension that has been uh, in the background in recent years and decades. It's been the elephant in the room, so to speak, lurking in the corner uh, of this crisis and conflict over recent decades. And I must say this, and I haven't yet said it, I do believe that um, credit should be given to Ankara for the um, patience uh, with which it received and in the last few days has responded to this um, recognition. Uh, things could have uh, been uh, very different and that yet um, uh, Ankara did, it obviously made its objections known, but it did it with um, with care and with diplomacy. And in a way, this has been this response of Ankara to the um, events of the 24th of uh, April of this year, the recognition of the Armenian genocide. It's one of the things that for me has been a kind of a tipping point in favor of saying, as I have done this afternoon, that maybe, yes, finally, uh, Ankara does deserve, has deserved, to be admitted as a, uh, a full member, as, as a member of the Minsk group. I, I think um, this demonstrates, um, it's not for me to use the word maturity, how, how dare I? I have no such right to use such large words, but um, I think the response has been highly mature and I think it demonstrates and ought to demonstrate to the Armenian side, including internationally, that um, there is a basis for cooperation and collaboration in all respects in the future with Ankara, with Turkey. I think they, they should be um, congratulated for that patience they've shown in recent days. Thank you. And I think we'll come back to uh, Turkey in, in our questions, but I want to begin uh, with the first question which was submitted to us, um, which I think is a very powerful uh, question. And that concerns the systematic destruction of graveyards uh, by Armenia. Um, our questioner um, says that um, uh, they are from uh, Zangilin. Uh, it's not even part of Karabakh, which was the smallest in size and population among occupied lands by Armenia. Uh, it is more than 70 village settlements all graveyards have been excavated. Um, and and the, the questioner asks about, um, while we can restore historic buildings, what can we do? How can we restore uh, people's loved ones' graves? Yes, I agree with you. And do you remember in my remarks, in my presentation, I said that this is about the um, religious and cultural heritage of, of both sides or of any other sides that have um, lost or um, suffered from the destruction, etc., of such heritage. I think it's very important. There's been a lot of concentration in the news media in recent weeks regarding Armenian religious and cultural heritage and sites, but it also, of course, applies to earlier um, loss, damage, destruction, etc. And I think that's why it is so important that this be Come an international effort. Um, and that's why I've suggested that some kind of inventory, um, not only within Karabakh, but also within other uh, uh, districts that were occupied for some time around Karabakh to begin with, and then extend that to Armenia and Azerbaijan um, more widely. I think that work needs to be done because this is a loss not just for the questioner. This is a loss for you and me as well, Carl. This is a loss for humanity, isn't it? And so I think um, this work needs to be proceeded with on all sides. It needs to be properly internationalized. And as I said, if it can be done well, it can provide 
um, good practice and a template for equivalent work being done in other parts of the world in the future. So I am very sorry for what's happened uh, to the questioner. I'm sure it's very terrible, but um, uh, this work needs to be done. And, but it's, it needs to be done for all sides, not just one side. I want to turn now to some questions uh, we've received on the subject of multilateralism, uh, which um, I think our questions have really um, il are illustrating the challenges around multilateralism. The, the first one um, concerns the role of France, uh, which obviously has the large uh, Armenian diaspora. Um, and um, for, for Azerbaijan refugees, uh, this might undermine uh, the, the potential role of France um, as a neutral uh, player in, in this dispute. I wonder if you had any thoughts um, on that. Yes, well, I touched on it, and it's a very valid question from um, those that are um, preoccupied, concerned about uh, this question. France did rather in recent months declare its hand somewhat um, in favor of the Armenian side, although I think for those following the conflict for a long time, it's always been understood that uh, France was um, somewhat supportive of the Armenian side. I don't think, and I don't think that in any way disqualifies them um, from the diplomatic and mediatory effort, and I don't think it should exclude them. I believe that they still play a very important role in the Minsk group. But yes, um, I remember for very many years, we must be honest, mustn't we? For very many years, um, Baku said that the composition of the Minsk group, the membership of the Minsk group was lopsided um, to their disadvantage. And I think there does need to be some balancing now. Um, hence, again, in part, my remarks about Turkey being admitted as a new member of the Minsk group. Yes, I mean, Baku was, we must be fair, for very many years, they were always complaining and saying, you know, look at these three countries, um, quote unquote, um, it's composed very much to our disadvantage and very much to the advantage of the Armenian side. So I do think there needs to be some form of correction. What that is in the end, of course, I won't decide. I understand that, but uh, I think there needs to be some comp uh, some correction in the composition of the Minsk group. Indeed, and one of our questioners on that on that very point points out that uh, even Mr. Tom DeWall shares the view that France has to be replaced with another country or some um, something has to be done uh, to um, for the revival of the OSCE's uh, Minsk group. Yes, well, I, I don't, is... if I may just interrupt you, yep. I, don't, I want it to be clear. I don't believe that, um, uh, I don't believe that France should be removed from the Minsk group. I believe they should remain um, a member of the Minsk group but I repeat that the Minsk group needs to be revitalized and refreshed. And continuing with the theme of multilateralism, one questioner asks for you to expand on the idea um, uh, that um, on, on the role of Turkey and Turkey's potential admission to the Minsk group. Uh, he asks, you know, would it have made uh, the 2020 war less likely. Uh, perhaps it would have been even more difficult for Armenian leaders to justify peaceful territorial concessions uh, if demanded by Turkey too, uh, especially considering the influence of uh, Karabakh and Armenians on Armenian politics. Uh, so mm. again, one of the challenges here of multilateralism. Well, we'll never know. And of course, as I always say to my students, hindsight is useless at the end of the day, isn't it? It's something we like to discuss uh, about. But um, yes, I, I do think it might have helped if they had been a member of the Minsk group earlier, but we'll never know. And it doesn't really matter because um, it's too late now. I do think that um, uh, I am increasingly persuaded uh, that um, their participation 
in the Minsk group now would be of um, benefit to all sides because we mustn't uh, imagine that we can go back to the situation before the 27th of September last year. We can't. The situation that existed before the 27th of September last year has now changed uh, tremendously. So we are in a new uh, situation now. And so that's why we need to perhaps think about some things that might have been even unconscionable just a few months ago. I think we need to be bold and look towards the future in the ways I've tried to suggest. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be, look, I'm under no illusions. Uh, I appreciate that politically, not only in Karabakh, um, uh, on the Armenian side, but also in Armenia, I understand that politically it's not going to be uh, a pill which would be easy for them to swallow, but I, I think they would um, eventually see the sense of it. Uh, another question uh, from, from our audience, uh, who very much appreciates the forward-looking nature of the talk. The questioner, um, uh, suggests that there may be two immediate international humanitarian legal issues that require action from Azerbaijan, stopping cultural erasure and the return of POWs. Both would, could be spoilers to any further genuine discussion. Um, what's the role for the international community there? I think that UNESCO mission needs to get there as soon as possible. Uh, hopefully it's only days away. I think that there needs to be institutionalized in the way I've indicated. As far as prisoners of war and detainees are concerned, I told all of you earlier, as uh, sincerely as I could, as humbly as I could, um, I'm not, of course, precisely aware of the situation uh, on the ground with regard to POWs, detainees. It's possible that there are people that have been picked up for other reasons, for example, both during or perhaps possibly after the, during the war or after the ceasefire. Yes, of course, that's urgent um, religious and cultural heritage and sites, as well as uh, detainees and prisoners of war. As I indicated in my presentation, that's what we need to do uh, and try and sort out as best we can in the short term. It's vital in terms of religious and cultural heritage that we don't lose anything more um, I think that's vital. Uh, goodness me, I mean, I, I want to weep again as uh, a citizen of the world. As a citizen of the world, I weep the last 20, 30 years uh, globally at all the uh, cultural heritage, religious sites that have been lost, not in the South Caucasus, but around the world. And I really think we need to um, uh, put a stop to this because it's, it's happening too much and we should know better, shouldn't we, in the 21st century? Uh, well, that I think brings us nicely to the, the next question. Uh, and because maybe this is another role for, for the international community and that's around who's going to finance um, uh, all the, to try to restore the destroyed homes and infrastructure uh, in, in the region. That, that as a result of war, is there, does this have to be, I, I'll add to the question, I think, does this have to be really an international uh, effort? Yes, I think so. Um, various UN agencies are currently involved in the um, situation uh, post the ceasefire of November. And I think this would be um, a, a UN-led and driven interagency effort to provide that kind of support. Uh, including perhaps potentially through initially a donor conference for members of the international community to um, assist in uh, processes of rehabilitation and reconstruction and return, etc. I think that's very important. And I, and I have no doubt that the United Nations is already working on this. I'm sure, um, I'm sure they are. We also have comments, um, and this is an area that I was very interested in, around uh, refugees, uh, displaced persons uh, who've lost homes, uh, who may be living in tents and dorms. Um, what are th is there a, a need for creative solutions to, to the problem of, of displaced persons? 
who may now be for for a significant period of time displaced mm-hmm. and and putting down um, uh, a sense of place and belonging elsewhere. I mean, is this is this, this and I know from. Uh, a former a student of mine who did work on South Ossetia, that um, uh, there may be a need for uh, not simply return, but thinking creatively about how to move forward. Well, you could, um, we could, and we haven't discussed, I didn't discuss population exchanges, for example. That's something which I'm not personally um, in favor of in any um, conflict environment. I am of the opinion rather that um, former occupiers um, should always be given um, the right of first refusal, so to speak. And after that has been established, um, then uh, proceed from there. But I think that's a a very important principle to give um, uh, former uh, original occupiers that, that right of first refusal as to whether, for example, they wish to return uh, or perhaps lease or sell um, their property in whatever capacity. Um, For me, that principle is important. I I think in the 20th century, we had too much of uh, exchanges of population and and I don't think that that has uh, um, helped us looking into the the recent times and recent decades. So I think uh, original occupiers um, should should be predominant here. Okay. Uh, what do you recommend? I think it's a very interesting question for moral recovery of both sides. Uh, uh, the question goes on, Azerbaijan intellectuals do not consider this war as a victory because of Russian military deployment. Um, I suppose in any... Uh, post-conflict situation, there has to be a kind of both moral reckoning and moral recovery uh, to be able to genuinely move forward. I think in the short term, as I've kind of indicated in my presentation, there needs to be, other than the immediate work that needs to be proceeded with of the type I've uh, described, there needs to be a a, a pause, a kind of a, um, a spiritual Um, moral, intellectual pause um, on all sides. I think it's very important that in the coming period, politicians uh, and others, but particularly political figures on both sides are responsible and don't uh, try to grandstand score points and inflame an already very difficult situation. And then in the medium to longer term, I think it's then uh, for the two sides to try and establish Uh, what they can um, do in in terms of truth and reconciliation in the future. But I think that requires uh, a lot of time and it needs to be um, something in which the the two sides are given the space, the space um, by outsiders. The two sides are given the space by outsiders in the international community, all outsiders, to uh, find those uh, means and processes of dialogue and exchange and interaction. Um, and that's going to take a lot of time. And of course, intellectuals uh, within both communities, Armenian and Azerbaijani, are surely, yes, um, going to be at the forefront of those processes, not exclusively, but at the forefront. So very important. I just hope that in the, in the short term, political figures can um, continue to be, as they largely have been since November, continue to be responsible because they can spoil a lot very quickly. Another question. What are the international legal issues that you think are uh, particularly relevant for the discussion now after the 10th of November? Oh God. Um, (laughs) I hope I, (laughs) I hope I try to outline them. I don't want to tire you and exhaust all of you by going through them again, but um, yeah, so the type I, I went through, I said, didn't I, that at some point um, the status of Karabakh will need to be determined. Um, there's no urgency for that, um, but at some point that will have to be settled once and for all. And um, I think that's something the Armenian side is very 
anxious about. And if I think Baku can, in due course, give them uh, assurances that uh, yes, um, that that status will be determined, that they um, will be given some form of autonomy, self-government within Azerbaijan, and that they do regard Armenians not only within Nagorno-Karabakh, but Armenians more generally um, as having a future and a place uh, for prosperity and uh, livelihood within the country as a whole, then I think that that's um, something that will be of, of tremendous benefit, um, not only for uh, all Armenians, not only in Nagorno-Karabakh, but also I think it would reflect very, very well. It would reflect very, very well on Baku and on the Azerbaijani people. I've spent a lot of time in Azerbaijan um, over the years, um, including, of course, in Baku and across other parts of the country. I, I'm aware fully of their generosity, um, their humanity, and um, hospitality, and it's really an opportunity for them to, to show it. Uh, things that people like me know and realize for, for them uh, to demonstrate that to the rest of the world. So I think they can do it. I'm very optimistic. Uh, I think this next question builds on, on some of those comments. It's a tough question, though. Uh, how do you see the, the final settlement of the conflict? Uh, what should we expect after the five years of the mandate of the RU peacekeeping forces ends? if it happens? In terms of the, the peacemaking force, I think as I tried to indicate, eventually it should be brought under a UN mandate. It can still be a, a Russian-led um, force. I personally, I personally have no problem with that. Why not? But under a UN mandate, and then gradually transformed uh, that mandate as time necessitates, and hopefully eventually withdrawn, and as I indicated with regard to the status, the future status of Karabakh, look, I said, didn't I, in my presentation, there's two ways this can go. We can either imagine that we're still uh, back in the situation that existed before the 27th of September, 2020, and we can spend another generation, 60, 50 years, two generations, if you like, discussing this status question, and it will never be solved will it? It will never be solved um, by um, taking more, if I may say, maximalist positions, or um, I think um, swallowing the pill and acknowledging that Karabakh has and always has had, truthfully in my humble opinion, a future within Azerbaijan, uh, administratively, uh, and including uh, de, de, de jure and de facto within Azerbaijan, all that needs to be uh, resolved and settled in the medium to long term, preferably the medium term, is its actual status and capacities within Azerbaijan. I think it can be um, done. I, I think the world needs to stop um, dividing and breaking up countries. Um, the world is getting smaller, and yet we want to break up countries. I think we should be coming together rather than the other way around. I don't accept that Armenians and Azeris can't live together. I think those people that believe that are, are wrong. I think they can, they used to. Um, life is not difficult, including for different ethnic communities at the best of times in other countries around the world, but we have to try, don't we? Because otherwise um, the effects of this might be to encourage war and strife and suffering, uh, not only for that to continue in the South Caucasus, but to encourage that to occur in other corners of the world. And I, I, think, I think we need to move away from that now. And indeed, it, it, what it may call out for is more, create, more creative ways of governing uh, mm -hmm. uh, territories, of multi, multicultural territories. Um, can, I just, can I just interrupt and add? We need to get away, not only within the South Caucasus, but also internationally. We've got to try and get away from this, Carl, I think, winner takes all um, sort of um, atmosphere. I don't like it. Um, I, I, have, I have a lot of sympathy uh, for that. I think uh, I do think we're seeing the, the fallout of that, in, as you say, all over the world. Um, 
uh, you've talked a little bit about kind of future prospects, five years, the five years down the road scenario. Could you comment a bit on the broader future security perspectives of the region that you see uh, coming out of this conflict? I've indicated in my presentation that I think um, these processes need to be regionalized. Um, I think that those can begin in terms of economic and trading relations. I think those are less politicized than some other areas. I indicated that uh, the situation in Georgia makes that uh, doubly difficult in, on, on top of the difficulties in bringing the Armenian and Azeri uh, communities uh, together once again. The regional actors, uh, the local um, neighbors um, need to be involved in that. And I think also organizations like the EU and the Eurasian Economic Union need to be um, uh, brought into this process because uh, we've got this sort of fault line across Eastern Europe right now uh, with regard to discussions regarding NATO expansion and how far east, for example, the EU is uh, going to ev eventually um, move um, in terms of expansion of membership. And I, and I think that one thing which I'm disappointed upon, which hasn't yet occurred, which I think needs to start to begin, and there's no reason why uh, Karabakh can't precipitate this, the South Caucasus can't be the cause of this. I think the EU and the Eurasian Economic Union need to start to talk to each other and see um, what um, commonalities they share, what aspirations they share, and what can be uh, built and framed around that. And I think that's a pity that that work hasn't been done so far. In terms of security, of course, that should regionally include a security dimension, but I don't like always to emphasize um, security. I think sort of the less politicized things such as um, economic and trading relations need in the short to medium term to be brought to the forefront whilst the um, more tricky um, security dynamics of the South region are um, then uh, perhaps followed up with uh, for longer difficult and take some time because of the reasons I gave at the outset of this answer. Thank you. And continuing on the, the, the multilateralism uh, a theme, uh, but from a different quarter, uh, what are Iran's prospects for engagement in the region uh, after, after the recent Karabakh war? Well, in my security issues in international law course, which I teach actually was mentioned in your introduction, it's actually taught this semester the final class was just over a week ago. At the beginning of the course, I uh, told my class of around 40 students that I felt that now there really was a opportunity for Washington to um, begin finally after, what, 40 years to engage with Tehran. And I think um, we're going to see that not only in terms of the uh, nuclear agreement, but also with the US and NATO forces now withdrawing from Afghanistan, the role of Afghanistan, uh, the role of Iran becomes ever more important. And it's noticeable, isn't it, that Iran has been talking to Saudi Arabia, for example, recently. Um, and I think that's a, a very important process. So Iran is a key player. And um, importantly, um, has a role to play in the South Caucasus, both in terms of economics and trade, but also in terms of security, uh, transport. Um, so I, I believe that uh, they can play an important role. I'm still um, a little bit unclear myself as to what that role might be. Uh, I definitely believe that it's something that we should examine and uh, in the longer term encourage, because I think Iran has always, um, in relation to this conflict, um, tried to um, balance its position between the two sides. And I think that has been appreciated by both sides, including up to this day. So I, I see no reason why Tehran can't be involved. 
uh, quite quickly in, in these processes. I see no reason at all why it can't. Uh, we have a questioner who asks about uh, the maps. Uh, how realistic is it uh, that the Armenian side will hand these maps to Azerbaijan? Uh, if we and the question goes on, if we want, if we talk about upholding the norms of international uh, uh, humanitarian law, we should discuss this topic too. Yes, um, I have no idea, um, Mr. Questioner or Mrs. Questioner. I have no idea um, what maps exist or what maps survive. Um, I have no idea how comprehensive they are. As I indicated earlier, I believe that what are should be handed over, all of them, the soonest. Indeed, I would say they should have already been handed over, but I think because of the um, injuries that are being sustained, deaths that have been sustained in recent weeks, it's really vital and very urgent. Um, they may not be comprehensive. Um, some may have been lost because of the recent war, but whatever survives, I think need to be handed over without preconditions. Listen, we're, we're talking about civilians, and the questioner rightly discusses national humanitarian law. This is about civilians, uh, and um, um, of course others besides, but principally about the welfare of civilians. I, I, I don't think this is something that should be traded. So I think these maps should be handed over ASAP without preconditions. Uh, I should also mention we've had a lot of very positive uh, comments to you, Tim, about your presentation uh, in, in the questions and answers. Okay. It's been pointed out that um, uh, it's much appreciated, the, the balanced approach that, that you've tried to take. So I, I wanted to pass that along to you. I know this is... Mm -hmm. Obviously, a very, yeah, for obvious reasons, uh, an emotionally charged issue for many people. But I think there's a um, there's certainly a view that uh, you are um, uh, doing your very uh, an admirable jo admirable job at trying to to take a balanced and and fair minded uh, approach. So I think there mm -hmm. people are very grateful for that. Following up um, on a uh, a point I made. Uh, but taking it a little further, uh, do you see the poor state of Russia-U.S. relations as posing any major problems in relation to the peace process? You know, I've been reading a lot of the um, op-ed pieces, if all of you will forgive me, particularly um, in the Western media and coming out of Western think tanks, including in Washington, over the last few weeks, I have to say I'm a little bit sat here in Moscow, uh, a British citizen sat here in Moscow. I'm a little bit disappointed with this kind of cynicism and this, uh, oh, Russia's trying to take control of the region again. I think there are opportunities in the South Caucasus arising from this recent war for Washington and Moscow to work even more successfully as they've been working successfully um, on the Minsk group for many years now. Uh, I've been following the statements coming out of uh, Moscow um, in recent weeks, like everyone else has. Uh, there, I've not read a single statement in which uh, Moscow has said uh, that uh, this process cannot or should not be internationalized. I, I have not read any statement coming out of Moscow saying that other countries cannot participate, including on the ground, in the future. Obviously, um, I understand that Russia has particular interests and concerns in the region. Goodness me, for many years, uh, these countries used to be part of a country called the Soviet Union. Um, we mustn't forget that. We must, in the Western world, as Westerners, um, acknowledge that. But I see every reason um, for Washington, the Western world more generally, to collaborate very efficiently and effectively in the short to medium term and into the longer term um, re regarding this conflict and the wider region, the South Caucasus, because I notice that um, uh, with the um, events in Afghanistan, Washington are going, Washington is going to have to work uh, very closely with Moscow um, on the 
um, withdrawal from Afghanistan. I believe that's positive. And I have noticed the what I would call the sincerity. Uh, I think when President Biden speaks about his desire for multilateralism, I, I think he's sincere. I think he really means it. And um, thank God for that, in my humble opinion, um, uh, at last. Uh, I think it's very important. So I think not only in the South Caucasus, but if that multilateralist approach can be proceeded with, without ignoring China either, perhaps a lesser role in the South Caucasus, admittedly, then I think uh, a tremendous amount can be achieved to our surprise, all our surprises, um, very quickly. And I'm, and I'm hopeful. I, I don't like this approach uh, from some think tanks, uh, Western think tanks. I'm sure there are similar remarks on the other side, which I haven't yet had the chance to read in Russian. But nevertheless, um, I, I don't like this kind of cynicism and um, suspicion. I, I think there's a great opportunity here uh, for Washington, Moscow, and uh, the Western world more generally. It's a great opportunity. Let's take it. Okay. Well, I think that's an excellent place to to stop today. Um, we've tried to answer as many questions as we can in in the time we've got uh, allocated. Uh, but I do. I want want to. Uh, uh, take this opportunity to to thank Tim for uh, a really informative and stimulating presentation today. I want to also thank our audience members for their participation. I don't think I've ever seen so many questions and comments coming in uh, from an, in, an engaged audience. So we really appreciate that. Yes, and before I, uh, before I um, go, um, I'd like to thank the Institute. Thank you, Carl, for organizing this. And yes, I, I made light of it, didn't I, earlier? Of course I did. But um, I apologize for the loss of connection um, earlier. It happens sometimes where I am. And um, I hope we didn't lose too many people. But uh, no, thank you uh, to those of you that survived. I, I think we, um, uh, we've managed. It's uh, one of the, the challenges of the uh, current situation is obviously we're reliant on technology, but one of the advantages of the current situation, which I suspect will be uh, uh, one of the benefits uh, for the long term, is our ability to connect with people all over the world. The, uh, and on that point, let me conclude by saying that the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies has an extensive program of online events. Registration is free and everyone is welcome to participate. You can find further details on our website, which also includes videos of past events. And uh, if you uh, are in London the, and uh, are a member, the Institute Library has now reopened uh, and our plan is to continue a gradual reopening of on-site services in the weeks ahead with a, an incremental approach uh, as the situation allows. So please do check our website for updates as well. Until we meet again though, whether remotely or in person, it's goodbye from now, for now from the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies in London. <laughs>